Hey, thanks for being a part of the conversation. This is Play It Forward. Real people, real stories, the struggle to play it forward. Episode number 560 is with National Geographic's Ann Williams, Treasures of Egypt. Good morning. I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Absolutely fantastic. My God, this book. First of all, the weight of it. Oh, there's so much to this book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's almost like you've given everybody who reads it uh, a gigantic chunk of granite, and it says, okay, now go learn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hoped to structure it so that um, it is a big, as you see, big, gorgeous coffee table book, and I hope people will enjoy it on that level. You can just sit down and flick through and look at the gorgeous photographs. Um, But I also tried to put it together so that it's a good read and so that it would make sense to people who are interested in learning a little bit. I mean, my idea was that you, most people don't come to the idea of ancient Egypt saying, I want to know everything there is to know about the Old Kingdom. What they say is the pyramids were built at Giza. What, What is that all about? And so I tried to give people an idea of, you know, what that part of Egypt is all about, how the Nile functions and the narrative of ancient Egyptian history, what the deserts are all about, Mm -hmm. how Alexandria came into being, um, the places that Egypt sort of went out and conquered during the height of its wealth and power and influence. Um, so, so I think it works on a number of levels. Uh, it's, uh, it's eye candy, yes, but you can read it and you can learn something too. Well, it also teaches continuation, that it, this didn't just happen, that there, 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 there had to be people, there had to be elements, there had to be something here before everything was put into place. And even though it is ancient to us today, it wasn't to them back then. Yeah, well, it it is, I mean, it is a little daunting. It is 3,000 years of history. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's a little difficult when you first dive in to wrap your mind around that. Right, right. Um, but I've tried to I've tried to divide it um, so that it's so that it's easier to understand. Well, yeah, because I mean, I, I look at it as as a place of exploration. I also look at it as a place of reference, as well as authentic history. This this isn't a once upon a time type of thing. This actually took place. Yeah, well, the the really interesting thing for those of us who follow Egyptology is that there are discoveries being made all the time. And the more you know, the more you want to know. We know the names of kings. We know who they were married to. We know who their children were, who worked for them, who their high officials were. We know where they lived. We know a lot about how they lived. So the more you learn, Learn, the more you're putting together this giant jigsaw puzzle of ancient Egyptian history. And when there's a new discovery, those of us who follow such things read all about it and then say, aha, here is this new piece of the puzzle, and I'm going to take it and put it, click, mm-hmm. right here in the great puzzle of 3,000 years of history. And that is one of the things that makes this so compelling. Um, There are discoveries that are being made all the time, um, and it's about people. It's about how they lived, how they went about their daily lives. It's not just about kings who ruled the whole place. It's, It's about, you know, some guy who gets up in the morning and decides that it's a day to go out and fish in the marshes <laughs> along the Nile. And he gets his reed canoe and he goes out and he paddles and he, you know, gets some nice fish and brings them back home and, you know, the day goes on. You know you know what you paint here is a picture of that it wasn't a black and white world. And, and what I mean by that is, is that so many times and so often we see black and white photographs of all of this, you know, excavating and stuff like that, the digging of, you know, King Tut and all that kind of stuff. But they were black and white photos. They, no, but, but you don't do that. You give us a colorized version of the experience. 
Well, uh, yeah, it, it is very difficult to envision from the early black and white photographs mm-hmm. exactly, you know, what a, what all of these discoveries are conjuring up. Now, we are very thankful for those black and white photographs. And one of the really great things about the discovery of King Tut's tomb, um, which we are celebrating this year, it is mm-hmm. the 100th anniversary of the discovery. But one of the great things about that discovery was that the lead archaeologist, Howard Carter, <clears throat> not only was a meticulous man who took great notes and took a good long time cataloging and curating and conserving the the more than 5,000 things that came out of King Tut's tomb. In addition, he understood the power of photography, and he had a really great photographer named Harry Burton, who was on loan from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And those iconic black and white photographs that Harry Burton took, they are just an invaluable record of what Howard Carter found and how he found those things and what condition they were in when he found them. So yeah, it is a little difficult to sort of conjure up the colorfulness of all of this stuff through those black and white photographs, but we are very happy indeed to have them. You know, what's what's really interesting about this is that through his lens, we have these pictures today. He spoke to the future. This book in my hands is for the future as well. I mean, I, I truly understand that continuation. This, this is not something that's just going to be in one family. I think it's a great reference for schools. Yep. Um, if they're teaching ancient Egypt, I think it's a really great read. I think it's a great read for armchair travelers, people who will never go anywhere, don't want to go anywhere, um, just want to open this up and learn about an ancient culture from the comfort of their, um, you know, uh, requirements or in the living room, they can do that. I think it is also a really great reference for people who are going to travel to Egypt. Um, I sort of put it together also thinking that, um, you know, people... People want to know what Giza was all about. Mm -hmm. People want to know um, how the Nile River played into the narrative of ancient Egyptian history. Um, And I've tried to give people an idea of that. They can come to this book and they can learn about that stuff chapter by chapter. And the chapters are not long reads. You know, you can read a chapter in five minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, You have five minutes before you have to start dinner. You can sit down and read that. The other thing that I did was I pulled out biographies of some really interesting archaeologists who have worked in Egypt over the years. From W. Flinders Petrie, who is one of the first super meticulous archaeologists and one of the people who trained Howard Carter. Um, from him all the way down to Salima Ikram, who is one of the prominent Egyptologists working in Egypt now. Salima is an expert in mummies, both animal and human. Every time there are remains of animals or people that are found in an excavation, Salima gets a call. She lives in Cairo. She packs her bags and goes to wherever it is that this discovery has been made. Um, She is an Egyptologist. She's a physical anthropologist. You walk along the landscape of of Egypt with Salima. Her eyes are always on the ground. She'll spy a bone, pick it up and say, this is the bone from the back of a puppy that was about six months old. I mean, she's just astonishing to, to walk through Egypt with. Wow. Do you ever wonder what this generation is planting in the soil for future archaeologists? I mean, because I mean, a book like this, this like you said, this is 3,000 years ago, and we're all in wow and awe because of, of how they lived and what they built. But today, I, do we have that type of impact? Yeah, I think about that all the time. <laughs> I think about that when I take out the trash. Um, I think about that when I go for a morning walk around my neighborhood and just think about, you know, the kind of 
stuff that people have in their yards, the kind of stuff that people throw out. Um, I don't know. I, I think that future generations may find modern culture very puzzling. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I also wonder, I mean, the wonderful thing about ancient Egypt is that so many of the texts have indeed survived. They were carved on stone. Yes. Um, they were inked on papyrus, which ha- some of which has survived in um, in the dry climate of Egypt. And um, but but what is going to survive? I mean, how will all of our digital stuff survive? I I don't know. That that's a great puzzle. Yeah, I talked about that recently on a show where I, I said I, I I couldn't go back because my smartphone wouldn't work. They don't have the technology to go back into the past. So I think I'll just stay right here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, I mean, that's a really great question, and, and it really does um, sort of encourage us to give a think about what we're doing and what kind of legacy we're leaving for the future. Yeah, because, I mean, look, look at the pyramids of, of the ancient age, and, 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 and look how grand they are today, but what will these skyscrapers look like in the future? And, and, and that's, you know, yeah. just to kind of look at all sides of what this book does, it makes you think is what it does. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, what one of the things that um, somebody asked me recently is, you know, in your work in archaeology, what are some of the things that keep you up at night? Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the questions? And one of the questions is, why empires fall? Mm. You know, why, why did ancient Egypt come apart? On paper, it should not have come apart. It had a river that um, fertilized its fields during the annual flooding season. It had abundant architecture. It had marshes that were filled with birds and fish. It had, um, it had connections with all the surrounding areas that had trade connections into the Mediterranean, trade connections down to sub-Saharan Africa, trade connections along the coast of the Red Sea. Um, it had it had mines. It had um, it had um, so many smart people working on scientists. Yes. I mean, just imagine yeah. the yeah. engineering it took to build the pyramids. So on paper, this empire should not have fallen. So what on earth happened? Um, I don't have the answer, but I think it's an interesting thing to ponder in thinking about ancient Egypt and thinking about also modern times. Yes. Um, you know, where where are we headed? And what lessons can we learn from Egypt? To that that rose so high and fell so dramatically, um, yeah. I I think it's I think it 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 ancient Egypt offers food for thought on many different levels. What a beautiful book! And you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Will you be brilliant today? Okay. <laughs> you too. Thanks a lot.